G'day everyone, I'm artist Wayne Dowson and this is the third and final video of our interview with Mr. Alan Brideoak. But before you start watching, I'd like to mention this book. It's The Grim Glory and it's featured in the painting. This book has very special meaning to Alan. It was purchased by his father, who was a World War I digger, whilst Alan was a prisoner of war with the Japanese. And the book talks about the 2nd 19th Battalion, which Alan belonged to, and their time in Malaya. This is part three of our interview with Mr. Alan Brideoak. That's how lucky lucky we were. Did um, they realise that the, the boats were full of prisoners? No, no, there was nothing to show. Nothing. Nothing about prisoners at all. They just thought they were cargo boats going to Japan. And were all of the prisoners on the boats, were they Australians or were they all different nationalities? Oh, nearly all Australians with us, yeah. Nearly mm. all Australians. And in our mob, yeah. There were about 1,200 on us. On your ship? Mm. And all cramped up, cramped up all the way, you know. And, uh, anyhow, I finished up with Berry Berry. It started to blow up in the feet, you start to blow up between the toes. That's the start of it. It gets up the ankles, up your leg, you, you know, it's skinny legs, you, and your legs are big and fat. It gets up here. I was carried off the boat with a blanket under me, and uh, they helped me off the boat. And uh, they sat me down, I can't walk on, and all stomachs out. It gets up into your chest and chokes you. It's very, very, but anyway, we got onto the wharf, got unloaded, carried off, and I remember there was a lot of gear there, and they sat me down there. This fellow gave me this meal. Oh, did I feel good? I was that good, I could have, you know, swum on with you. But anyhow, I saw all these mates going left, right and centre. The only thing that I was good about was I was going with old Reggie Newton as old major. And I went with him and uh, when we, we went on a barge then and uh, we went across the bay and uh, in this barge. Got unloaded and ended up on an old truck. They lifted me onto a truck, either of us, and we went to the Zawama prison of war camp. And there's a British prisoner's of war in it, and been working in the mines. And uh, it, yeah, we, we got put in there. And with them, and uh, I was the sort of a hospital section, they had me there. And they were giving me these tablets, and they tell me there were tablets that were coming out of the Red Cross parcels. And the Red Cross parcels were coming in, we weren't getting them. The Japs were eating them. The Jap guards were eating them, and uh, there was these tablets, and they were giving them, giving the blacks the tablets, and they were eating the food. So we were eating these vitamin B tablets probably, and uh, anyhow, I finished up. I started to go down, and I remember I'd go to the toilet, stand there with them. You'd come back and just get back in. You got to go back again, and I was going in like that. You know, I was going down. And I gradually got right, and uh, so we had uh, I was about ten days. Got to go down the mines. Then I heard some stories, you know, the boys come back with these stories, and I thought this is it's come to another end down there. And uh, I don't know whether I can uh, explain it plainly to you. We walked and walked it was three miles under the sea. And the moment you got in there, you were soaking wet. It was raining all the time. And the pumps were working. If the pumps broke down, we were locked in there once, 28 hours. The pumps had broke down and we couldn't get out. We were locked in there with water. It sort of creaks, you know, up and down. You know, that's the way it went in there. So anyhow, this, this night, first time, oh, God, we've got a cap lamp on. We've got a little pair of cotton shorts on. And they had these tow boots. Your big toe went in one and like that, and the, your others were out like that. Went down, and uh, we got to a drive, and then there was a rope ladder, and you had to crawl up about eight or ten feet where we were working underneath. 
and that only could see just with what your lamps were there. And he crawled up this ladder. Now up in there, uh, this is look. I thought this is the end of the world. They put a drive right through probably hundred yards uh, with conveyor belts on it. Can you follow me? Conveyor belts. And there's only a hole about from here to your foot, of course, where we'd crawled up to get in there, because the machine had gone up in there, the, the uh, electric motors drive from the conveyors. Well, that big long conveyor went right along like that for about 150 yards, and then they had another drive out here at the same distance. And they kept going like that. And there's a conveyor. It we were on the shovel, shoveling into the conveyor, and that was going along and going into this one, coming this way, and it'd go down the hole that was called up. That was the, how we were, the trucks underneath us, empty trucks, filling the trucks up, see? So we there, right, oh, oh. it's going, going, and next thing, we called them the suicide gang, there were mother Japs come in, and behind it where we're going, 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 they've got to drop it. They've got to fall it to make it safe to where we're working. And uh, it wasn't a safe mine anyway, it's shocking mine. And there, you'd see these little fellas hitting props underneath, taking the chips out, of, and they'd jump backwards from here over to the kitchen. They could jump backwards. There'd be a fall. And some of the old British miners are there, they keep up to the face. That's the safest place in the mine here, is keep right along to the face. And we're worthy, and I know where the guys are, well, this is it. And when it started to fall, it'd be a lot of whoop, whoop. And we're told to keep our mouths open. Because we're, the compressed air in there was, well, <laughs> you know. They reckon it rupture your stomach if you didn't keep your mouth open. And said so the only way that we could escape was down that flaming hole we'd crawled up. And seeing all the warm, all ton, thousands and thousands of tons of earth falling, whopping and mud and air pressure. And, uh, and it was out. We could have a bit of. Yeah, and all that sort of thing goes. It's kind of in the bed off from here to the kitchen off behind us where they stopped. And I thought, why wow, they this is it. <laughs> I thought I'd finish. And how, how long did you work in the mines for? Twelve months. And when you came over on the boat, what, what, where did you come to? Where did they take you to? What part of Japan was were you in? Uh, well, there's a main island, the North Island, was the southern part of the North, Northern Ireland. Yeah. What's the name of the mine, uh, village? Ohama. Ohama village. That is a tanko, they call it, that's the uh, roll call, tanko. Uh, all had to line up, stand up in our room, but tend to a room. And uh, I was the uh, itchy van in the room, or they called the Jeff Scores the number one. I had to do it in their language. You know, so many underground work, or so many, where they were, they'd be stand up, they'd only be half of them there. Half of them still underground. Some might be one or two at the toilet, might be one at the toilet, and, uh, and might be one asleep, they'd been asleep with that. They've all got to stand up and be counted. <coughs> Anyhow, standing then, I'm standing then, I've done my job, and I'm, you could sleep standing up, we're always tired. Next thing I could hear the roar and bellowing down below. Then you could hear the thump, 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 they're running upstairs. And they're running along the corridors, the corridor right along past our rooms. And uh, they're running along there and they run into our room and grab me. And there's three of them, you know, I'm getting a real punch up. And you know, you can't resist, you can't fight back. Otherwise they'd take you out and shoot you. So we are right, they'd give me, you just had to take it, take it, and they carted me out, took it 
took me down and tried to push me and make me fall down the stairs. I hung on, hung on, hung on, and I got out up there and there Italy, standing up, and you don't go down here because you get kicked. You got to try to stand on your feet all the time and taking it and taking it. And so I got out there a roar going at it, and the next thing I hear a roar, the old major, roaring Reggie in the middle. He's roaring, and he charges in and roaring, he's grabbed me with the, you know, the front, and he's waving, he's, he said, say, I was denying it, see, say you did it, say you did it. So right, I said, yeah, I admitted it. Oh, and he's roaring, get going, get going, he's pushing me away, he took me away. That's the psychology he had. And uh, he roared, but Jeff's were laughing. Jeff's were laughing. That's how I got rescued off with him. You know, I thought the world was a great man. He used to stand up to the Japs a lot like that. And, but that's that's how he got away with that one. <laughs> oh, I got away with <laughs> it. They're all in a single room, about ten to a room. Lights on us all night. Uh, on a matting, on a matting, call your matting stuff. And we laid on that and we all slept pretty close together to keep warm, snowing outside, a lot of snow. And uh, you had to get up about probably at least six or seven times a night to go to the toilet, you know, with this rice diet. And uh, it's funny, you go on the other end, you'd probably go once a fortnight. If you went over a fortnight, the doctors would want to see you, and they'd give you an enema. And... But that's strange, isn't it? But, oh, go whittle all the time, backwards and forwards, you know, and just get settled. And, and then they were a flea plague there at one stage. Fleas got in this match, and they, they gave us, they had mosquito nets, so we had these mosquito nets. We slept on the mosquito nets and held them upside down. Slept inside and get away from the fleas. Then you went to get up, you had to the toilet. When you come back in, you'd brush your legs and everything before you got back in again. The fleas are coming up your legs. <laughs> lice, lice in all the clay, clothes. And one stays in the summertime, the bugs, the bed bugs, that are all. So it wasn't a real pleasant place. Mm. But we got a food just about enough to survive on. You know, we weren't, a, you know, real, you know. So you had, had been at Changi and you'd been on the Thai Burma Railway then. Yes. And then you had come to Japan. So. What what did you look like at that stage? How you know what kind of weight were you? Well, I was taken off the boat when we got there with Berry Berry. I was pretty big then, but when I went down, I was down to all around. I suppose about eight and a half stone. Yeah, I was into about eight and a half stone, I suppose. Yes, well, we were down the mines, three miles under the sea. And they're all uh, mainly uh, civilians down there, no soldiers, civilians. Some of them, most of them were fairly good. There was a, an occasional snag amongst them, but anyhow, this fellow come along and he's got a sugar bag with his cat in it. And he's come along past my gang, anybody that could kill and dress this cat. And uh, no, no, nobody, uh, we couldn't do it. And he went down the, line, the tunnel a bit, you know, way down. He's asked the same question, no, no, no. And some fellow says, well, Bridey will do it. Because Bridey was killing a pig and a, used to do one every week up in Thailand. He's the butcher, he'll do it for you, he can do it. So he's come back looking for Bridey. Why the gee, he's cranky too, because I let him go past. Anyhow, he, and I said, all right. I said, he had to find me a knife. He went away and he found, he came back with an old pocket knife, a shocking one, it was 
pretty blunt. I had a bit, found a bit of old stone and ordinary stone and all, you know, out of this pile there and tried to sharpen it a bit. Anyhow, I felt in the felt the sugar bag and there's the old cat in there. And anyhow, I felt where his head was and I got a piece of timber and tapped him on the head a few times, kill him, emptied him out and there was a great big old tabby tomcat. And he had this big pair of knackers on him there. And anyhow, I didn't go much on the look of him, so I rolled him over and I, as I skinned bloody rabbits as a kid, thousands of them. I stuck a knife in his leg and his nerves in him must have reacted. And wow, and he fiddled all up my right arm. Stink like, oh, God, it stunk. Anyhow, I dressed this bloody cat. I went back to camp that night and nobody had anything to do with me. They were all keeping away from me. And there's no such thing as soap. Soap was no way, you know. Anyhow, I got out in the garden and I'm dirt rubbing dirt on me and I go back and have another wash. Well, they had a great big tub, only the size of this room, of warm water. And they had little wooden boxes they'd made and you tipped it over yourself. That was the old bar. Tipped us over. That's how you had a wash when you come out of the mines. Warm water. It was good, you know, in the winter time there. And and anyhow, I went and uh, every time I walked past someone, they'd remind me. <laughs> that was stuck. And I went back down the mine next day, and he'd come with this little box, a little Meshiaco, uh, and he's got that, and I looked in it, and there was a hind leg of this cat. And they called it Daikon, that was a sort of a radish thing, and a bit of soup in it. That was for me for dressing his cat. He's still thanking me. And there's about four of us in there, four or five of us in this gang, and they're looking at me. Geez, you're a lucky black body, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't say nothing because I thought a lot. And anyhow, we used to get about half an hour for lunch. And yeah, they're all watching me like dog, watching hungry dogs. And I said, here. Yeah. Yeah, it's all yours, share it up. Well, they got into it. I can remember still working one of the boys out in the bar. He's chilling in it. Good luck to you, boy. And they said, well, you're too bloody well fed, Brody. Yeah, you're too getting, you must be getting back us the world. You're too bloody well fed. Oh, look, honestly, I only used to throw up when I smelt, you know. I'd look at that cat in the, you know, that little one leg. I couldn't do it. I'm, I'm pretty hard, you know. I'm, but anyhow, that's, that's what happened there. I said I was too well fed. <laughs> My old major, uh, we're going to get some meat, they said one stage. And uh, they came to me and said, oh, this is one we're prisoners. They're still over us. I didn't tell her that story, and uh, he come to me and he says, you go, Brody, he says, and I'm leaving it to you, you do do the right thing, you know, get what you can out of them, yeah, right out, right, right. So I, there's a motorbike pulled up with a sidecar in it, a great big box, and I had to sit in this box with this mad driver, and I had a special armband put on me, you know, that they wouldn't shoot me. So way we go, this mad driver, he was mad. It was Jap? It was Jap drive, yeah. And went to this abattoirs. And they're killing horses. And knocking these poor old hordes there. And he, it was terrible. And they used to put a rope on their neck and pull them out of the chute. And uh, they had a ring on the floor, pull their head right down, and all the floor slippery and wet cement. They'd bash their heads in. And then they'd, you know, hang them up, and uh, I was supposed to get some meat off, so go and get some meat. Do you know what they gave us? The, the lungs. 
Ma vatsori kitsel ma ei enää, ma nagu neliga nokta jõudu, nüüd tuttu mõi ja võtas kiit väge ära võtta. And about three or four guts of the horses, and about three sets of lungs. And I'm sitting on top of all the lungs in there, you know, <laughs> hanging on, coming out. <laughs> no, Major, he come along when we got back. He looked at me and he said, I'm disappointed in you right now. <laughs> I said, next time I will send you, I said. <laughs> you talked about um, the time when you know, when there was something going on, you knew that there was something happening. Oh, yes, well, uh, we knew it was fairly close because when we first got to Japan, you could either hear a plane or look up in the sky, you'd see the vapour trail of big bombers. And they weren't Japanese. And they, they were just aerial photographing, I suppose, for the future. And then it got to every now and then you'd see one, then it got you'd see one every day. Then you'd see a cave from going over. Then one day it got, got closer down the street in the village where they kept, uh, a fighter plane came along and machine gun the street. And we thought, well, you know, this didn't fly from Australia or America, this plane. The aircraft carriers are out, you know, not far away. And this is how we knew, like, it's getting closer, it's getting closer. And uh, so anyhow, uh, it just, it got closer and then it was nearly continual bombing. And we were very, very scared when you went into the mines, you stopped there for 12 hours. And you didn't, you didn't leave what you were doing till the next shift came in. If you're shoveling onto the conveyor or a jackhammer, you just hand it over to the next bloke and they turned and walked out. Or at once, some stages there, there was two shifts under there, everybody was under there. And we thought if they hit the power supply, we we're going to be drowned all like rats, of course they had big pumps. This pumps that oil off the, you know, pipes, both sides gushing out water 24 hours a day. And if that, that broke down, well, we got caught at 27 hours, or 27 and a half hours, I think we counted. We were locked in there once. Creeks had rise, you know, and uh, the pumps had broke down, and see, they'd go down, they'll fall on the coal seam, you know. Then there'd be a creek, as I say, it's raining all the time yeah. under there, soaking wet all day. From the sea seeping through, isn't it? Yeah, it's all seeping under through, the sea. Yeah. And uh, then the, the, the creeks would fill up and we said, well, the idea we had kept lamps, like we had a carry it on your backside with the battery. Well, at that stage, because we had these old pommy uh, miners there, they knew, uh, he said, they never panicked, you know, they were good old blokes. And, and uh, if that happened, we cut off. Uh, we cut off a few times, but not for long sometimes, but the longest was about 27 and a half hours. And, uh, you know, it, it would take, it shut all the lamps off by one. Just, you know, understand me? Yeah. And you've got one lamp, because when it's down there in the dark, it is a huge as nothing. It's, it's as black as black. Black as inside of a cow. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, we put a little peg down on the ground or something, or something we could identify, see whether it was rising, you see it dropping, you know, and then it drop, oh, very good, next thing it'd come up again and not. But then you'd, after it wouldn't go, you could wade through it. You could wade through it and get out the other side. But uh, that was, it wasn't, it was a bit frightening at times. And, uh, that's the way it was, but anyhow it went on and on and on and uh, we went to work this morning and uh, we got to our heading where we were working and there's about five in my gang. I was an uh, itchy bad uh, one or one on the jackhammer and I had the privilege of going to his, that asked him, I could go to his bag, he had a sort of a sugar bag cut down with it strap over it and they had a saw and a tomahawk in there. 
for timber work, you know, to put the timber up. They carried a few springs in there, so oh, I, I thought, no, we went to work this morning and the Jeffs weren't working. They're sitting down and uh, sitting down and look all mumbling about five of them and uh, anyhow we were looking around, oh, what's going on, you know, and they didn't care whether we worked. So we did, we did a little bit of work and then the next thing I, I busted a spring on purpose. You could bust a handful of dirt down the exhaust and hit it, it'll break a spring. So anyhow, uh, I went back and I was about from here to the kitchen over there away. And they're, they're hard to understand. We could really make ourselves understood. We weren't fluent talking as you, mind you. But if they, were, they talked to themselves, they talked too quick. And it's very hard to understand. And I got my hand in the bag and I'm listening and listening and listening. And I remember you saying, uh, June E is 12 o'clock. June E is uh, uh, 10 to, uh, uh, when you're uh, in there talking, uh, decipher it, you get to one up to 9, 10, you say 10, they say 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3, like that, see. And it was 10, 10 and a 2 is June E. I heard Junie and uh, Tojo making a speech. Uh, and Tojo, and I forget what talk was at the time. Tojo was talking, and next thing he, essential worry, was war finished. Essential worry. Ooh, ooh, no! <laughs> this is something, you know. That's how I right. left the spring there, bugger it, I'm off. Back I goes to the gang and I said, right are you blokes, it's over, it's finished. And they just looked up like that at me and, and it was in the, during the war, the whole uh, prison war days, the war had finished a thousand times, but it was going to finish. And then they looked up at me and, poor old Brody, you were <laughs> the odd thing. He's gone. <laughs> and, uh, it's a funny thing, you know, there was hardly any bombing. When we come in that morning, there was no planes about. It was quiet. Oh. A lot quieter. There was a few about, not yeah. many, and it was pretty quiet. But see, as I say, we were down underneath, and uh, so anyhow, I got cranky with them. I wouldn't talk to them. You won't listen to me, shut up. I don't want to talk to you. So next thing, one of the uh, box boys, uh, we call them Marco boys, they come, they used to get little fellows, little short fellows, put them in these boxes about that high and they could keep their heads down, you know, where it went through low, you know, the the, the, uh, the winches, you know, they were on a big, big, uh, what do you call it, a cable thing, pulling them up and down, they had these click, click, and you know, they could go through. So one of the boys come down, what are you blokes out of this, it's over. So we packed up, we walked past these five, four or five blokes, Japs, they never even looked up at us. We walked past them and uh, we walked for about oh, two or three hundred yards in the mine, back to, there was a headquarters under the mines there, we called it King's Cross, it was underneath there, it was always a masting place where they used to all go out the different areas underneath, you know. So. Anyhow, uh, we got there, we were in the last there, they're waiting for it all to go out together. So we all, I suppose it was nearly 12 o'clock, and uh, no, it was nearly 2 o'clock, that's right. So uh, we all walked out together. I can remember the old major running out, he says, I hope you wakes know what you're doing. They never counted us in. There was no count in or anything like that. We all walked in and and uh, nothing said. And he said, oh, fellas worried, you know, we've got that far. He said, we've come this far, we've got to keep it right till we get out of it. So anyhow, we, uh, we all laughed and talked and all day nobody could go to sleep. You know, the night shift, they, they couldn't sleep. <laughs> 
So uh, then the bugle used to go about four o'clock in the afternoon to call the night shift out that, that to wake them up. They could go and have a little bit of rice and uh, put their gear on to go down the mines. So the bugle went, then uh, they had their little bit of rice, got up and you know, had their bit of rice. Time come, they marched up to the guardhouse, they had a roll call, this is going to end night shift. This is the day it ended. And then there was a hesitation, everybody's watching and listening. Watching them, you know, everybody's listening. And there was a hesitation, they didn't open the gates. The next thing, the guard came in to come out and dismissed them. Well, the whole camp nearly roared. Big roar went up. We reckon that's it.